Welcome to the Holistic Psychiatry Podcast. I'm Courtney Brown Snyder, a physician and holistic adult and child psychiatrist. In today's episode, I'm talking about understanding narcissistic personality, the importance of this, diagnostic criteria, contributing factors, brain differences, treatment, and prognosis. So first, why is it important that we all understand narcissistic personality? Everyone is impacted. None of us will go through life without being impacted in some way by someone with narcissistic personality traits. The incidence of narcissistic personality disorder is somewhere between 0.5% and 5%. As with anything, this can occur on a spectrum, so not everyone that has traits will necessarily meet criteria for a disorder. There can be a great deal of suffering for those with narcissistic personality disorder that can result from relationship and work difficulties or losses. There is also a greater risk of legal issues. Those in relationship with someone with narcissistic personality traits suffer as well. Many would argue that they suffer more. They can lose their self-worth, confidence, and even their sense of reality. They can also lose money, material possessions, and financial security. Those with narcissistic personality traits don't see themselves as having a problem, which is why they often will avoid mental health services. Their symptoms and traits can be covert. The traits are not always obvious. It can take many years for partners, spouses, and friends to realize how much of their own energy and resources have been in the service of a fragile self-image of the person with narcissistic traits. So what about the terminology? Narcissism comes from Greek Greek mythology and the tale of Narcissus, a hunter captivated by his reflection in a pond. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, number 5, describes narcissistic personality disorder as a pervasive pattern of grandiosity, need for admiration, and lack of empathy, with interpersonal entitlement, exploitiveness, arrogance, and envy. It is described as a disorder. So having narcissistic traits is different from having a narcissistic personality disorder. With a disorder, the traits need to be inflexible, maladaptive, and persisting and causing significant functional impairment or subjective distress. There is criticism of the DSM criteria. The definition relies on external social features, which I'll describe. It does not consider internal states of vulnerability, insecurity, self-criticism, shame, feelings of loneliness, emotional dysregulation, identity confusion, or fear. So in order to meet diagnostic criteria, one must have five of the following traits. Grandiose sense of self-importance, for example, exaggerates achievements and talents. Fantasies of unlimited success, so power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love, believes they are special and can only be understood by other special or high-status people or institutions. Require excessive admiration. Sense of entitlement, For example, unreasonable expectations of especially favorable treatment. Take advantage of others to achieve his or her own ends. Lack empathy, unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings and needs of others. Envious of others or believes that others are envious of them. Arrogant, haughty behaviors or attitudes. So what are the contributing factors to narcissistic personality? Like anything, there appear to be an alignment of factors, genetic, biochemical, and structural differences. Those with narcissistic personality disorder are more likely to have family members with narcissistic personality disorder. Having narcissistic parents, however, can contribute to more than just a genetic vulnerability. Early childhood experiences appear to also contribute. Psychoanalytic theory describes parents as lacking warmth, affection, and expressed appreciation of the child. Other psychological models reflect two ends of a parenting spectrum, one with trauma, rejection, lack of support, and on the other end, overindulgence and overprotection. 
So these are obviously opposing constructs. And while these two types of parenting may seem in opposition, both reflect a lack of attunement to the appropriate emotional needs of the child. Such parents likely had their own insecure attachment experiences. Naturally, children will align their thoughts and behaviors to increase proximity to and responsiveness from their caregiver. In the case of narcissistic personality, there may have been a need to go to lengths for attention from a disengaged parent, as if to exaggerate their worthiness. With overindulgent and thus anxious parents, a child may only feel secure when aligning with their parents' need to overindulge. In a healthy dynamic, a child doesn't need to focus on their parents' emotions. They are confident in their connection to their parent and can pay attention to their own internal state. This inability to pay attention to one's internal state can obviously carry into adulthood and also contribute to one's inability to have empathy for the internal state of others. Left brain tendencies are another factor. The right brain is actually activated and thus strengthened during the early attachment experience. To quote Ian McGilchrist, the left hemisphere's world is ultimately narcissistic. It is driven forward by a desire for power and control. It has a tendency for dangerously unwarranted optimism. It sees itself as a passive victim of whatever it is unaware of having willed. Cultural values such as prioritizing the individual over the collective may also contribute. Could undermethylation be at play? So undermethylation is something that I talk a lot about. It is a biochemical process that relates to a methylfolate imbalance and This process serves many functions in the body and brain. Those who under-methylate are more likely to be driven, competitive, perfectionistic, strong-willed, and have obsessive-compulsive tendencies, among other traits. So I would argue that those with narcissistic personality are likely under-methylated. From the Walsh Research Institute, we know that 95% of those with antisocial personality disorder are undermethylated. The Walsh Research Institute, however, does not have data on narcissistic personality, likely because many of those individuals don't present for treatment. But still, I would suspect most are undermethylated. Some may also have pyrrole disorder and or high copper. Most of the conditions that I'll list now can co-occur with narcissistic personality disorder, and many of these align with undermethylation. So other conditions that can be present include other personality disorder, such as antisocial personality disorder, histrionic, borderline, paranoid, obsessive-compulsive, and schizotypal. There are also mood comorbidities, as we call them, major depressive disorder, dysthymia, which is a chronic, persistent, lower-grade depression, and bipolar disorder. There can be substance abuse, alcohol abuse, alcohol dependence, and drug dependence. Other conditions can include anorexia nervosa, generalized anxiety disorder, specific phobias, and PTSD. Are there brain differences? So I will link to some articles that go into this research, but just in short, I would say there appear to be subtle structural brain differences, especially in areas associated with empathy emotional regulation and processing about the self. There are seeming alterations in how neurons are connected, especially in regions that appear to be involved in social understanding. So when I'm talking about these neuronal connections, I'm talking about the connection between particular parts of the brain. So this isn't as if there's one specific singular location. There's subtle differences in a number of locations, and in the connection between those locations. There's also linguistic research. So this relates to what people say and how they say it. And this is being looked at in the context of the structural and functional brain research. Can narcissistic personality be treated? Treatment that has been studied in mainstream psychiatry involves psychotherapy. The most studied and effective therapies share common aspects, including 
setting clear, realistic goals. This is to counter the grandiose and unrealistic goals. Attention to relationships. This to increase the recognition of the experience of others. Attention to self-esteem, so they can learn worth beyond titles, accomplishments, appearance, and money, and so forth. To learn how to work with a therapist. This can be difficult for someone who feels most secure when in control of others, and especially difficult if someone's not in therapy. There are no medications for narcissistic personality, though some of the the comorbidities, such as depression, certainly can benefit from medication. In my work, priorities would also be to assess for and address the Walsh nutrient imbalances, which again, I would expect to be under methylation in combination with pyrrole disorder and or a copper zinc imbalance. Can this condition improve or pose future risk? Based only on the use of psychotherapy, studies show that those with narcissistic personality disorder can improve, though it can be gradual and slow. There is evidence that there is an increased risk of Alzheimer's in those with narcissistic traits. Frontal temporal dementia is another form of dementia besides Alzheimer's, and rather than memory problems, Early symptoms can include acting inappropriately or impulsively, appearing selfish or unsympathetic, neglecting personal hygiene, overeating, and loss of motivation. Problems with language, attention, and planning come before obvious memory problems. If there is a new onset of narcissistic traits in an adult, frontal temporal dementia should be considered. For some, narcissistic personality may even be a prodrome condition, which means an earlier manifestation of frontal lobe dementia. So I hope I've given you a broader understanding of those with narcissistic personality disorder. In the next episode, I'll be discussing cultural implications, references and terms related to narcissism, preferred partners, spouses, and friends of those who have narcissistic traits, not necessarily who you might think. I'll also discuss traits of those who find themselves in these relationships, the collateral damage and how narcissistic traits harm others, and the tools for self-preservation and healing for those who know or who have been harmed by someone with narcissistic traits. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to receive this by audio and text in your mailbox each week, please consider subscribing at CourtneySnyderMD.com. There I have information on my non-patient phone consultations that I offer nationally and internationally. Thank you again for listening. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode. Until then, take care.